All right, thanks for joining us on the Iceland's Lagavegger Trail virtual tour. My name is Jenna Walker. I'm the program director for Adventure Outings, and I'm joined today by Riley Cox. He is our operations coordinator here at Adventure Outings, and we are going to take you a, a world away from Chico or wherever you're at right now, hopefully, uh, just for an hour though. So um, we're recording this just so that other folks get a chance to check out this tour if they can't make it. So please click accept if you accept. Um, as you're joining us, please meet yourselves along the way. We appreciate that. Um, as you have questions, please enter them in the chat and we'll try our very best to answer them. Um, this is where I also add the caveat is that I am not an Icelandic expert, unfortunately, maybe someday. Um, I've been to Iceland once before, but I absolutely loved it, and I hope to be able to share as much as I can on my trip, as well as things I've learned along the way, and hope to get you stoked on the Lagavegger Trail in Iceland. All right, so without further ado, All right, so we are going to be traveling to Iceland for this trip to the Lagavegger Trail. Um, you're subject to a few of my pictures in this, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, hopefully you like them. Um, you'll see another person in this picture. Uh, this is my husband, Thad, who is kindly consented to being in these pictures. He was my companion on the trip and in life, so uh, you will enjoy. So here he is at the start of the tour. So let's just focus on Iceland for a second. Um, where the heck is Iceland? So just gonna zoom out for a second to give us a quick refresher on where Iceland is. Iceland lies in the Atlantic Ocean in between Greenland and Norway or Scandinavia. Let's focus back in on here. So Iceland may seem like the most polar of countries, but it actually lies south of the Arctic Circle. It's right around uh, 64 to 60 degree, 66 degrees north latitude. So everybody thinks it's you know an Arctic country, but it's actually not, not quite polar. Um, another common misconception about Iceland is that it's covered entirely in snow. And while that's the case in the winter, um, there's only 11% of Iceland's terrain that's covered in glaciers. And most of that glacial terrain is covered by one glacier. Um, it's over here on what would look like the right side of the island or the southeastern part of the island. It's the Vatnajökull glacier and it covers most of the Iceland's glaciated terrain. Conversely, Iceland is covered 60% by lava fields and deserts. So we tend to think of Iceland as this really snowy place, but it's actually a lot of lava and desert. So Iceland, as you, as you probably figured out, is a, a pretty remote place. Um, so how the heck do you get to Iceland? Well, you could take a boat, but that would take a really, really long time. Um, I recommend taking a flight here. That will definitely shorten your trip. Um, some people fly just directly to Iceland, and when they do, they'll fly into Reykjavik International Airport. But um, you can also fly to Europe on Iceland Air and do a stopover in Iceland onto your trip. If you do a stopover, you can stay into Iceland for up to seven days at no extra cost, which is really cool. So if you happen to say, want to take a trip to Norway or Sweden, or France, you can stop over in Iceland at the beginning of your trip or at the end of your trip at no extra cost. And that's through Iceland Air. That's how I ended up here. Um, it was my husband had a trip to Norway that was through work um, and I just decided to invite myself along because I'm not gonna miss out on a great adventure. Um, so we were able to do a stopover in Iceland on our way to Norway.
So flying into Iceland, there's only one international airport. That's Kavlavik International Airport. It's just outside of Reykjavik. And Reykjavik is Iceland's largest city. It's also the capital city of Iceland. The population is roughly 230,000 people, which is just over the size of Butte County. And about two thirds of Iceland's population lives in the Reykjavik metro area. So out of 350,000 people or so in Iceland, about 230,000 live there. So that's a pretty huge percentage of the population that lives um, in that urban area and not in the country or in the rural areas. Reykjavik was the site of the first permanent settlement in Iceland. So Iceland's actually a really young country historically and geologically. The first recorded settlement was in 874 AD and that was by the Vikings. The Vikings came across from Norway, um, also brought their slaves along and settled in Iceland. There's some pretty amazing history that can be seen if you go to um, the National Museum of Iceland in Reykjavik. This is the National Museum. It's, uh, doesn't look exactly that exciting from the outside, but there's some pretty amazing historical, geological, and cultural artifacts in there. It was probably my favorite place in Reykjavik. While you're in Reykjavik, there's some other uh, great sites to see. The store, uh, the, the waterfront's really pretty. Um, the town itself is very unique. It has that small town kind of feel, sort of like Chico, um, but yet being a really big city. Um, and one of my favorite things to do when is to try the food. Uh, I used to be a really picky eater and now <laughs> um, enjoy trying some, some daring new things here and there. Uh, I wasn't daring enough to try this one though. This is a very popular item, uh, especially among tourists. Uh, we call them hot dogs, but in Icelandic, they call them pilser. And essentially that's a fancy Icelandic hot dog and most of them are made out of lamb. So not exactly your Costco hot dogs, no offense to Costco, uh, but these are some high quality ones that people are willing to line up for. Uh, you might've seen this at Safeway. Uh, Icelandic yogurt has become really popular and has been a staple in Iceland much longer than it's been in our, our Safeway shelves. It's called skir. It's basically a thick yogurt, um, kind of like a Greek yogurt, but a little bit more tart. Uh, this is my personal favorite, um, Icelandic fish and chips. The seafood in Iceland is really amazing because they have great cold water fish there. And this is halibut fish and chips, which is so good. Um, just wanna go eat that right now because it's dinner time, that sounds great. And if you're feeling a little more daring, which eh, I don't know, some of you might be, I'm, I'm not quite there. Um, there's some things you can try. I didn't include pictures because I figured people might get a little wigged out. Um, but basically, there um, you could try one of the delicacies. It's called sheep's head. So basically boiling a sheep's head and it's served to you on a plate with eyes. Um, there's also fermented shark. I think Riley might have tried it or at least thought about it when he was in Sweden at some point. I, I can't do that. Um, but I did give one thing a try that was very popular. It's called hard fisker. It's over here on the left next to the schmor, which is butter. And hard fisker is essentially this dried fish jerky. And I thought, oh great, jerky, it'll be really tasty. I love jerky. But I was on the trail. I, picked, I back, actually bought several packages of it because it's super light and just high in protein. And I threw it in my bag and I open it up and my husband thats, oh, what is that? That smells terrible. I said, it's hard Fisker. I'm so excited about it. And I went to go take a bite out of it and I started chewing it and tried to swallow it and just gagged because it was so salty. It just, it, it was a little too much. So buyer beware, uh, if you're gonna be adventurous, um, you might have some interesting stories along the way, but. Um, yeah, I, I still gag a little seeing this picture, 
Uh, but there's many, many other delicious things and you might love this. So you should try everything. So moving along from food because it's dinner time and I'm either making you really hungry or you've already eaten and you're tired of hearing about this. Um, let's, let's move on to some more fun things here. So the trail. Um, so we're featuring the Lagavager Trail, which is one of the world's classic treks through some of the most beautiful terrain that I and many other people have ever seen. So this trail is actually surprisingly easy to do on your own. You don't need to go get a guide service and you know pay thousands and thousands of dollars to be guided. You can be, um, but you can actually do this on your own and the logistics are pretty easy. So you can get yourself to and from the trailhead and then on the trail, you're good. So in order to get to the trail, um, there's a main bus station, which is called the BSI. It has a very long name that I can't pronounce, but everybody calls it BSI. And at the bus station here in town, it's really easy to access if you stay nearby. Uh, basically the buses go to and from the trailheads and all you need to do is buy a one-way ticket to your trailhead and then buy a return ticket from where you're gonna finish. Super, super easy. You can do it all online before you leave. And there's also flexibility if you decide to change your itinerary. Also, if you're worried about speaking Icelandic uh, or trying to pronounce any of this, <laughs> I was and still am nervous about saying anything, um, but most people speak English in Iceland. Um, they're quite fluid in English, which is really nice. Um, and they're also super friendly. All right, so the buses, usually a bus will take about four hours to get from Reykjavik to the start of the trail, which is Lamanleger up in the north. Most people hike the, uh, hike the Lagavager Trail from north to south. There's a few reasons for that. Um, one is that huts on the trail are typically booked only north to south. And then the second reason is that you start at a higher elevation and work your way down an elevation. You're essentially getting warmer as you go along. So you get essentially get the cold out of the way for the most part and get warmer as you move towards the coast. All right. So a few things about this trail. Um, the trail itself is 55 kilometers or in our terms, 34 miles in length. It's very manageable, um, easy to do on a stopover or on your own trip if you're just going to Iceland. Um, the kind of gear you'll need to backpack on this depends entirely on if you're camping or in a hut. So you'll need some general three season backpacking gear. Um, so like a sleeping bag rated to about 10 degrees or 20 degrees, depending on how cold you sleep. Um, you need a lot of shell layers, including a waterproof jacket and pants, and then warm layers underneath. The average temperature ranges somewhere between the mid-30s and the 50s, and there's typically chances of wind and rain. And there's also chances of beautiful views, too. So uh, you, you have to kind of know what you're getting into. Um, you're you're going to get some exciting weather here and there, but it's, it's totally worth it, even if you have um, a lot of rainy weather and not a lot of views. So upsides of camping versus the huts. Camping is great in terms of being a lot cheaper. Um, it's usually about $15 per person per night to camp out. Um, a hut would be more like $70 per person per night. Camping, you have some more flexibility in terms of who you wanna sleep next to and choosing that hopefully. Um, Whereas in a hut, you're sleeping on bunks um, next to other folks who are backpacking as well. Also in, with the huts, um, you do get food. So you'll get three meals, which is really great um, that you don't have to cook and you don't have to carry all the food, the, can the cooking gear, fuel, that sort of thing. Whereas backpacking, you're carrying and making all of your own food. So it's whatever challenge you choose. Personally, I'm a fan of camping out in tents, but those huts did look pretty nice one day when we were 
in the rain all day. So, uh, you know, I think the huts could be a pretty amazing experience as well. I have a question. Yes. Can you book like one hut halfway through and then tent camp the rest of the time? Or do you have to like book all the huts? I believe you can just book one, <laughs> excuse me, one hut. The huts are very popular and they do fill up months in advance. So you definitely wanna check in um, and Riley can include a link to the hut system and the FAQ in the chat if you wanna look more into that. Just check in the chat to see if there is. Oh, that's you, Riley. Great. All right. So let's get started on the trail, per se. We're going to start off on the north aspect of the Lago Vega Trail in an area called Lanman Lager. Note that I will attempt to do the best possible job pronouncing Icelandic as I can, but much to the chagrin of my Scandinavian grandparents, I have a really bad time pronouncing anything that sounds Icelandic, Swedish, or otherwise. So please bear with me <laughs> as, as I fumble through this. Uh, Lammenlager is an amazing place. It's located within Fjallalbak Nature Reserve. It's a gorgeous place. Um, lots of grass and wetlands. Um, you notice some vehicles here on the left-hand side driving in. It's a very popular place for tourists. Uh, there's people coming in to hike the Lago Bear Trail and also just to visit for the day. There's a small village where you can buy provisions and then also um, a small restaurant as well. Lemon Lager is known for a few things. Um, probably one of the most notable things would be its colorful mountains. I'm gonna skip to this lovely stock photo here that I unfortunately had to borrow because I didn't have this great picture. Uh, Lon Malager is known for its colorful mountains that are essentially rhyolite. Um, rhyolite is a type of rock and it, there's all kinds of different minerals that are on the mountains that make them different colors. So if you look at this photo, minus the small camera, sorry about that, um, you can see reds, pinks, um, some yellows, a little bit of green in here, um, whites as well. So those are different minerals that have been oxidized over time. The reds and those pinks are iron. The black is, here's some obsidian and there's also basalt. The yellow is sulfur and then green is moss. If you're really lucky, you'll also see some alpine wildflowers. They hit their peak in the late summer and there's beautiful wildflowers, typically right in the early part of August. When we were there, um, you can see a few of them out in the field, but there's small little white balls that um, we, upon closer inspection are cotton grass, and that's one of the um, most prolific wildflowers that you'll see out there. The whole field was all cotton grass when we were there, which was really pretty. Another attraction of Lemon Lager and a great place to start a trip, why not, is hot springs. Uh, if you're a fan of hot springs like I am, um, Lemon Lager is an awesome place for hot springs, and Iceland in general is amazing um, in terms of hot springs and their availability for you to soak in them. So this is a, a popular place, and the name Lemon Lager actually refers in Icelandic. It it um, translates directly to people's pools. So the people have found this pool, that's for sure. Um, the Lemon Lager is living up to its name here for sure. And the water temperature is a pretty, pretty comfortable temperature. It ranges somewhere between 99 and 104 degrees. So generally a pretty pleasant soaking temperature. 
So why does Loma Liger have hot springs? Maybe you're wondering that. Hmm. Well, there's a reason for that. This is the Torfajökull Glacier, and it's part of the Torfajökull Caldera. I'm going to zoom out for a second here. Such a big caldera, it's hard to zoom out on it. The caldera is about 15 kilometers in diameter and is roughly where my mouse is. So going from Torfajökull all the way up to um, this ridge and then over to Brynensstada. It's a very large caldera. And a caldera is essentially a huge circular crater that's produced during the largest and the most violent volcanic eruptions. So this one's 15 kilometers in diameter. And just for perspective, if you've been to Yellowstone, uh, then that, that caldera is about 60, 63 kilometers in diameter. So this one's about a quarter of the size, but it's still pretty massive. So geologically, this caldera is very young and active. So I think of this caldera as like an 18-year-old athlete here, uh, super active. It has fumaroles, hot springs, um, a lot of activity in it. And you'll see that. Obviously, we've seen the hot springs. But as you're hiking on the trail from Lemonlager up to Raffinusker, you'll actually see fumaroles with smoke, or not smoke, but steam coming out of the ground. And with all this caldera action, um, I've got a quick video about how um, Iceland was formed. So this was the first formation period of Iceland in terms of its geological history. It's really short because it's the end of a long day and I figured y'all would appreciate something short. So magma is rising from the seafloor. So there's a, a plume of magma coming up and it's hardening and Basically, the magma plumes keep coming up, hardening, and forming eventually. Eventually, an island. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about as much attention span as some of us might have right now, perhaps me. So, thank you all for tolerating the short video. So that was the first formation period that happened about 16 to 20 million years ago, according to geologists, where that magma plume rose up from the seafloor and kept hardening and hardened into the first parts of Iceland. The second formation period happened during the last ice age, and that was about 3 million years ago. And during that ice age, tuft and dolerite mountains and cliffs were formed. The ice age ended and then about 10,000 years ago when the ice was all melting, uh, the lava started flowing. So before that lava was flowing beneath the ice, which is I think a really cool thought to have, um, but now the ice was melting and lava was flowing um, without the ice being on it. So we now we can see the modern lava flows that we would see in Iceland along the way, like on this trail. Um, Riley, hopefully, will be able to include in the chat a video that's a little bit longer than the 26 seconds on Iceland's formation. I think it has um, some really cool information on it. So if you're more interested in that, definitely check that out. All right. So geology is a big feature of this trail and definitely a a big motivating factor for me wanting to go here because it's so diverse. So hiking the trail, you'll ascend essentially from the bottom of the caldera up towards the rim. There's a really amazing optional side hike um, in which your feet disappear. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Google's funny. And this peak is called Brennensteinsalda. It's a really pretty rhyolite mountain that gives some amazing views of the area that you're hiking. So I'll just give you all a quick panorama here. 
as if we're standing on top of a mountain. So you really have a lot of diversity and really colorful mountains. This is a bit of a cloudy day, um, but typically when you when the clouds clear, the mountain colors are just amazing. From Lemon Lager to Raffin Nusker, it's about 470 meters of ascent. So you're going uphill, going up towards the rim of the caldera, but I promise it's worth it. Um, once you get up there, you might find what Icelanders called a little snow when I asked them about how much snow was on the trail. So this is obviously, I think, a little bit more than a little snow. <laughs> This is the one snowy spot that's consistently snowy on the trip. This is Raffin Nusker. So you're probably wondering at this point something about huts. Um, well, first of all, if you're camping, um, you're typically camping in the snow, which is obviously a little bit colder. Uh, these are some tent spots that have been dug out. You can see the rocks are in those spots in order to secure tents down from the wind. But inside the huts um, is pretty pleasant. I managed to sneak in there for a few quick pictures <laughs> before I got ousted by the warden. Uh, but this is the kitchen area where you can cook any additional meals that you'd like to have. Most, most of the meals are pretty filling, so no need for that. But some of us are hungrier than others. And the bunks, which are pretty Spartan, but also can be a lot nicer than a tent especially if it's a little bit cold like it was here. Yes, so this was um, hiking on our trip when I had asked how much snow was on the trail. I said, oh, just a little snow. Uh, my, my husband laughs looking back at this picture the other day because he's like, we were on the snow for four hours. <laughs> it, was, it was not quite a little bit of snow in our language, but if you're in Iceland where there's snow on the ground most of the year, it is a little bit of snow. So it's all about perspective. So one interesting thing about Refn Nusker is that it's Icelandic for obsidian dome. So obsidian like the rock. So about 5,000 BC or roughly 7,000 years ago, there was a volcanic eruption that caused viscous lava to flow and blanket this whole area. And that cool, it, it cooled very quickly. And when that magma cooled so quickly, it formed obsidian. So we, I don't know if we'll ever be able to see this because it's usually covered in snow, hopefully not um, because that would mean everything's melting. But um, underneath all this snow is huge fields of obsidian, which is this black, super smooth, glassy volcanic rock. From Rathnusker to Alftavatn is about 12K, which takes roughly four to five hours. And now that you've gone uphill, you get to go downhill. Um, so there's about 500 meters of descent, which is always nice. Um, traveling from Refn Nusker to Alftavatn, you move from this higher, colder altitude back down to the ver verdant green mountains, like what are behind me in this picture. And before you descend down to that brilliant green, you also have your last bit of the colorful rhyolite. So if you look behind this person, aka me, in this picture, um, you'll see those little pebbles and stones of rhyolite from the mountains. Descending into Oftavatn, um, this place, I don't know if there's a hiker heaven, but it kind of felt like that to me. <laughs> uh, this brilliant green mountains. You can see the huts um, in the background. Um, also bathrooms and showers. Um, bathrooms are free to anyone, um, but there's also hot showers available. Really nice amenity to have on the trail when you tend to be a little bit colder and wetter than you might be otherwise. This place is pretty incredible. And I'm just gonna leave this right here because it's one of my favorite views of any hike I've had or backpacking trip. Um, 
there's a lake in the background that you'll be able to see. Um, that's the namesake of this whole area, Alftavatn. It means swan lake, swans like the birds. So the first inhabitants of the area noticed that there were um, swans who migrated to the lake and really enjoyed that area in the summer. And then once everything got really cold, they migrated away and probably enjoyed some much warmer swan lake somewhere else. But it's really easy to pitch a tent here and just sit back and think about how beautiful things are. And if you look out in the distance here, I'm gonna focus because there's some really cool peaks out here. Uh, there's the peak Hatful, which is straight ahead and just to the left, Storasula, which I will focus on in the next slide. So traveling from Alftavatn to Emster, this is typically folks second day or third day. Um, we, when we were hiking it, we traveled from Lemon Lager to Alftavatn in one day. And I personally like to have a nice big first day on the trail. Um, so that was roughly 24 kilometers, which was a nice day of probably eight hours of hiking and occasional lounging and enjoying yourself. But most folks um, take their time and would hike to Rafinuskur the first night and then off to Baden the second night, making this essentially a four day or five day trip if they wanted to extend it one more day. So on the third day, um, you are hiking through these verdant green mountains, which I know this looks like everything is very icy here. Um, it is Iceland. So this one area <laughs> captured in Google Earth looks very icy, but I promise you that uh, in the summer it will look like this. Um, this peak is called Storasula. Um, I would say it's my beloved mountain because <laughs> I, I kind of got a little obsessed with it. It's a beautiful, sharp peak. Um, Storasula in Icelandic means large column, which I don't know if that, I could call it like a pyramid or something, but I didn't name it. Um, nonetheless, while it doesn't have a, a beautiful meaning to me, it is a beautiful peak and a beautiful name anyway. So Storasula is a peak that just kind of follows you around, just hanging out in the background, just watching over you. Um, I appreciated that. Um, but as you're hiking, you're traveling more th through um, valleys and um, through mini gorges, essentially doing river crossings. And this river is called the Kaldavskafel River. That means a cold straddling river confluence. Uh, there's two big rivers here um, that come together in a river confluence. And it's really an amazing place. So as you're crossing these rivers, this is actually, crossing rivers is kind of a big part of the Lagavager Trail. So there's, there's a hierarchy of, of river crossings as I like to think of it. You get the great bridges. Um, this is Thad standing on a bridge over a deep gorge. If you're really lucky and have way more money than I do, uh, or access to a vehicle like this, um, you'll find yourself in a high clearance vehicle driving through one of the rivers. This also looks fairly treacherous to me, but uh, who am I to judge? Also another cool feature of the Lagavager Trail are the bridges on wheels. I'm sure it has some sort of great name, but bridges on wheels seems appropriate to me. Uh, these bridges move as the water level changes. So initially, um, as the trail opens for use in late June, i.e. all the snow melts, um, the snow is melting and the river is a lot higher. So as the river changes levels, the bridges are able to shift, but they don't move. It's not like a, a moving bridge as you're walking. So if, if that makes you nervous, don't, don't worry about that. It, it stays in one place uh, when it's not rolling. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would say, I wouldn't say this is the least desirable river crossing, but probably the most common. Um, this water is very cold. It's glacial melt, so it's roughly just above freezing, so just above zero degrees Celsius. 
And luckily, this is not a very deep crossing. This is roughly ankle deep or so. But there are many more crossings that are typically um, ankle deep to knee deep. But they're so pretty. I mean, look at the mountains behind here. So <laughs> just have to think about that as your, your feet are feeling like they're going to freeze off. As um, the hike continues on from Aftavatn past Dorasula and the river gorges and the river crossings, um, there is a very stark transition that starts to occur from the verdant green hills into the stark basalt flats. This is one of my favorite spots. I, I'm a river person, but there's something about this mountain too that just feels great. It's also the picture of my background here. This is Hatfell, an ancient volcano. And you can see the Lagerbaker Trail right here and some folks hiking on it. These are basalt soils. And if you've spent any time in Upper Park, you know what basalt is. Um, think of Salmon Hole and those that basalt rock, so black volcanic rock. And these are all basalt soils. So not much grows in the basalt soils, but some things do thrive. Um, my personal favorite element of flora here would be this flower, which is the sea campion. Sea, like I'm going to sail the sea. So this plant is a little special. Um, it's got these sort of bell-shaped flowers. You can see that. And in Icelandic tradition or myth, perhaps, this flower is called dead men's bells, like bells you would ring. And apparently picking it tempts death. So if you're feeling like you want to bring a butt flower back from Iceland, I don't recommend this one. <laughs> We've had enough death tempting these days. Uh, I recommend Staying away from picking the flowers, especially this one. So obviously I took a picture and left it for someone else to hopefully not tempt death with. So hiking through the, the salt flats will take you to the third night of your trip, which is at the Emster Botnar Hot. This is a really cool place, especially for these folks here. They're having a little romantic moment because it's so beautiful, they just can't stand it. Maybe. Okay. It's funny when no one laughs, it's just very quiet. So they're probably not laughing. Uh, this is this black basalt soil. Uh, it's kind of what we saw earlier, but the green in here are drainages. And you can see folks walking down here. Everyone likes to camp on a nice green grassy spot. Why not? Um, these drainages typically will have a creek coming down. Um, it does rain a lot in Iceland, so not the best place necessarily to camp if there's a lot of rain uh, because your creek bed will soon become a creek, but it doesn't look super wet there now. And this place looks perhaps a little bit like Maybe the moon, uh, minus a little bit of green, and obviously the tent. So very stark place in a sense, but um, has a lot of contrast as well. So hanging out in the background here is a massive volcano and also a glacier that covers the volcano. This volcano is named Katla. And it's covered by the Myrtis Yokel Glacier. I'm gonna zoom out just for effect here to show you how big this glacier is. Pretty big. So this is a very large volcano, um, especially in comparison to the trail, which is roughly 34 miles from uh, Landman Lager to Thorsmore. Very large volcano. And Katla is a feisty volcano as well, in addition to being massive. 
So Katla is an active volcano. Um, it most recently had a minor eruption in 2011. And that, that eruption was pretty, pretty minor on Icelandic standards, especially when we talk about another eruption that happened um, just the year earlier. So um, just as a quick reference of Icelandic history here, whenever an eruption happens, the glacier, i.e. the snowfield on top, will melt from the heat that's coming from the magma and the lava that's flowing out. So whenever that glacial ice cap melts rapidly due to volcanic eruption, that glacial melt creates a flash flood. And this flash flood is a glacial melt is called a yokel hop. And I think we would call it, it's not exactly equivalent, but basically a lahar here in the US. Hey, Jenna. Yes. We have a question. Um, Anne is wondering if you were able to see any puffins while you were hiking or if you mostly spent time inland. Oh, Anne, I would have loved to have seen puffins. I did not see any, but I, I feel a little bit of FOMO right now that I did not see any. Um, I spent a lot of time, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, mostly inland. Oh, I was muted. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I think that they're only there very specific times of year in specific coves. And I was just curious because I was not fortunate enough to see one either when I was there oh. for a few days. So, well, hopefully we both can get back and see the puffins. Oh, that'd be a dream. <laughs> yeah, and I, li I linked a photo in the chat of what a puffin looks like for anyone else who, like me, had no idea what that was. <laughs> All right, sweet. All right, the Katla volcano. Um, so one thing that's really interesting about this massive volcano, uh, about 100 years ago, similarly, I feel like 100 years ago, things kind of happened at similar times. Uh, <laughs> Spanish flu, there's a, all kinds of things, but about 100 years ago, uh, in 1918, there was a yokel hop or a lahar from an eruption of Katla, this volcano. And that eruption was so massive that the Laharic flood deposition extended the coastline by three kilometers. So basically what happened was the eruption was really big. A lot of the glacier melted, created a debris run, and all of that debris made the coastline about three kilometers longer from the deposition. So Katla, she's feisty, uh, apparently is not super active at the moment in terms of erupting, but you never know. Um, as I was hiking through here with my husband, we noticed some signs placed along the trail and they basically warned you about volcanoes and evacuation. Um, we, we really didn't think much of it, you know, we're here just, you know, taking a picture, hey, hey, you know. Uh, <laughs> What a beautiful glacier, uh, not really thinking about some sort of massive glacial run that would knock us off and land us three kilometers in the ocean with a bunch of deposits. So, uh, you know, I, I would say ignorance is, was bliss at that point. <laughs> so moving towards Thor's Mark, which is the end of the Lagavigger Trail proper, um, you encounter a really wide river gorge, and there's some irony in Iceland, I feel like, and this, this is one of the most ironic things. This river is called the Thronga River. It looks like the Pranga, but anytime you see the weird looking P, like the little shrunken down P, that actually is pronounced th, like th. So this is the Thronga River, and Thronga in Icelandic means narrow. <laughs> Yet this river crossing was over a mile wide with a bunch of braided channels. And um, I just, I, th I think that's funny. Uh, life, life is funny sometimes. You just have to smile at it <laughs> as, as you're, you know, gritting your teeth walking, walking through really cold water in beautiful places. So you, you might have noticed or might not have noticed, like I, I didn't really notice, um, but along the trail, 
there's not any trees for the most part. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is the terrain we went through initially on this trip is not really um, conducive, the soils are not conducive to forests and trees. There's another reason for that, um, and that is due to settlement. So these are some small trees, there's some birches in here and some other trees that I can't really identify based upon this picture. Um, but trees grow near the end of this trail in Thor's Mork. And one interesting thing about trees in Iceland, so settlement began around 874 AD from the Vikings. And at that time, about 25% of Iceland was covered in forests. Um, of the land area not, that wasn't covered in glaciers, of course. So a few decades happened and that number was reduced down to 80% because um, it was reduced from 80%, I'm sorry, was reduced to 20%. So basically within a few decades, 80% of basically the whole nation's timber was cut to use for pastures, for houses, barns. Um, so most of the trees were taken out and today only 1% of that original population of trees is even existing. So trees are really rare in Iceland, um, but I love trees and it really feels special to walk through a forest of trees, especially after not being in it, around any trees for a while. Other fun fact is Thor's Mork in Icelandic means Thor's woods and Thor is um, refers to the Norse god of agriculture, war, um, and apparently trees in this, at this point. Uh, and Mork means woods. So this is Thor's woods right here. We're walking through um, the god's woods at this point, which I don't know, felt, felt like something that could be pretty divine, especially with wildflowers blooming. The Laga Vega Trail proper. So technically the trail ends in Thor's Mork, uh, which is a nice place to end. Um, this is where my husband Thad and I ended our, tri our trip. Uh, we also had a meal and a nice drink in this hut right here. It's a restaurant as well. Some tasty food, highly recommend that. <laughs> and on a clear day, you might get lucky to see some views. Um, right, you can see um, if anyone is familiar with lenticular clouds, there's this crescent shaped cloud that looks kind of like a jellyfish in, in the sky right here, and, or a crescent, depending on your characterization. But that lenticular cloud is essentially hovering over a volcano and lenticular clouds are indicative of high winds. So what's going on under this volcano area? Well, Glad you're wondering about that. So there is a very large volcano and it has a very large name that most people, including myself, have a very difficult time pronouncing. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a shot though. It's called Ayafiatulugul. And this volcano is quite feisty, perhaps the most active in Iceland. Back in 2010, 10 years ago, um, this volcano erupted and it was a really massive eruption. So that, that was its latest eruption. So what happened with this volcano is that volcanologists noticed that seismic activity was increasing and you know, Bangu was on the move underneath this mountain. There was more CO2, um, more, um, you know, some earthquakes being felt. So what happened? The fissure in the earth opens up Initially, lava starts to pour out of the fissure slowly, and then the eruption goes explosive, just like in this picture. So what happens? Glaciers melt, then creates the yokel hops or lahars, which are essentially these destructive mud flows down the volcano, not pictured here. And then the ash from this volcano drifted all the way into Europe. So basically the ash blanketed farmlands. It also covered up airports. And um, I know a few folks who were stuck in Europe, uh, much much to their chagrin actually, 
uh, for several months where, you know, because essentially air traffic was delayed for at least a month back then due to this volcano and all the ash. So here's an exciting picture of some uh, some uh, smoke and ash and fire, all, all the fun stuff that holds up. And this, this is probably my favorite picture. <laughs> At least they're not driving towards the volcano uh, at this point, but um, pretty great to see, uh, I don't know. It's not great to see something blow up, of course, but um, I personally, I would have wanted to see it. So if you're hiking just the Laga Vega Trail, um, this is where your tour would end and you would take a bus home. Um, there's a great option to add on. And if I would go back, I would go back and do this. Um, I would definitely add on this trail. It's called the Fim Bordel Haas Trail. And essentially it's an extension of the Laga Vega Trail. And this trail goes from Thorsmore, which we just were at, up and over the pass by Ayafiatuliokul, and then down to Skogar. It doesn't seem super far, um, which it's not. It's about 25 kilometers, roughly 10 to 12 hours of hiking. Um, but most people don't end up adding this onto Lagavager because there's about 3,000 feet of climbing and then 3,000 feet of descending in that time. And it's usually done in a day. So um, personally, I would go back and do it because I think just the sights alone would be stunning. Um, but you can always choose to end your tour at Thorsmore. So as you're hiking towards Fimbordelhaz Pass up by the top of the volcano, you start to get views, if you're lucky, of course, on a clear day of the volcano. And as you travel down from the pass, you are rewarded for all of your hard work in Skogar. So the first really cool thing about Skogar is the turf houses. Turf houses, or um, I think what Riley and I would probably call maybe perhaps, or lovingly call a hobbit house. Um, these are um, essentially houses that are built with turf and volcanic stone. So as you notice, there aren't a lot of trees in Iceland and the trees that were there were harvested and cut down and no longer exist. What does Iceland have? It has a lot of volcanic rock as we saw, and it also has wetlands that create um, grass for turf. So turf is actually a great option for roofs and for houses. Um, turf is a really great insulator, which is really helpful in that cold Icelandic climate. Um, I think it's probably even superior just to wood and stone alone for sure, and can help keep that warmth in. And a lot of these turf houses like this one are built into the hillside or into like basically the side of a hill. So that allows for better insulation and better ability to capture that warmth that's created And if you want to know more about turf houses, hopefully Riley would be so kind to put in a link about turf houses. You can learn a little bit more about the history of turf houses. Um, how many times can I say turf houses in one point? Uh, you, you get the idea. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I think they're fascinating. And last but not least, you're rewarded on this tour with a beautiful waterfall. This is called Skoga Foss. So any kind of waterfall has FOSS at the end, F-O-S-S. -S. And this is a rather magical place. If you don't feel like hiking 3,000 feet up and over a pass for 12 hours or so, you can always take a bus here as well. So ch challenge by choice. And at the end of your trip, I highly recommend before flying out a trip to the classic Blue Lagoon, I'm not giving you that Instagrammy Blue Lagoon picture. This, this is real life here. <laughs> so the Blue Lagoon is a hot spring area. It's obviously pretty popular here. Um, it's known for its Arctic blue waters. 
um, warm temperatures. And there's also a silica clay that's on the bottom of the pools that people will tend to put on their faces and walk around, look kind of like aliens. Um, but <laughs> it's what you want to see at the end of your trip, right? A bunch of people with, you know, crazy masks on. But this is a really relaxing place. Um, pretty great for soaking those uh, sore feet and muscles after a trip of backpacking and great place to end. All right, well, that's all I had for the tour. Any, Riley, are there any questions from the chat? You just had a, a question pop up from, oh, okay. from Gerald. All right, Gerald said, is this trail one among just a few such developed paths in the country or are there numerous others? That's a good question. Um, the Lago Vega is by far the most famous long trail. Um, there's other short hiking trails. I'm not aware of anything that is of that length. There are also numerous um, like wilderness or national park areas throughout Iceland. Yes, and there's also other huts in Iceland as well. Um, if you go to the fi, I think it's fi.iceland, which would be fi.is website, you can also check in on um, hut locations and that other thing where if you're playing a shorter trip or a different route that is a little more off the beaten path, um, you can check on huts and camping in those areas. Is it expensive to go to the Blue Lagoon? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a good, it is. And, you know, it, there is a bit of a tourist trap. I'm not going to lie. Uh, personally, I, ha I think I've had more fun at the Icelandic or that the Reykjavik public pool uh, is also heated by hot springs than I did here just because there was a slide. <laughs> Uh, but most towns in Iceland have some sort of hot springs or pool. It's more of like a city pool kind of thing. Um, but there's there's plenty of hot springs that are much less developed than this around Iceland. It's just a matter of seeking those out. What time of the year is best to visit Iceland? That is a really good question. Um, for hiking, the best time of the year, in my opinion, and according to many others who have been there, would be sometime between July and August. I was there in early August, and that seemed to be pretty great um, because most of the snow had melted for the trip I was on. It's also the most popular time of the year in terms of tourists. So if you're looking for a wilderness experience on in popular places, um, you can expect to find crowds for sure. But I'm someone who generally avoids crowds and really enjoyed this trip and all the places that I went. Um, just having a little bit different of a mindset going into it. How many hours of daylight? Woo! <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, camping out in August, um, I hadn't slept before underneath, um, it, you know, in that close. Uh, that high up in an elevation, or not elevation, but in latitude. And yeah, uh, it never really gets entirely dark in August. Um, there's still, there's about three hours or so where it gets darker, but it's never really quite entirely dark. And that is very odd if you're someone who likes to wake up and go to bed around when the sun goes up and down. So uh, that, <laughs> that was definitely a key feature of this trip. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, I hope to host, spend more time in Iceland. I hope that you all are at least slightly inspired to add Iceland and possibly the Lagavegger Trail onto your bucket list and to maybe get out there. Um, if you ever have any questions about Iceland, I probably might not know the answer to them, but I'll do my best to find answers for you. Um, I really love the Lagavegger Trail and I'd love to be able to share what I know and um, help 
guide you as best as I could on your way. So feel free to email me. Um, my name is Jenna Walker, and you can always search the Chico State website. Um, you can also go on to our adventure outings website at ao.csuchico.edu. We might be in working on some more tours for the spring. Um, not sure where we're going in the world yet. We're, we're trying to figure that all out, but um, we look forward to seeing you all later. <laughs>